Welcome to the Social Emotional Lives podcast, the place where we bring light to research, experience, and resources to support our youth's social emotional needs. My name is Faith Harview, and I am a graduate student at UGA studying educational psychology. I'm also a fifth grade teacher at a Title I school in Gwinnett County. Growing up with an anxiety disorder and not having the support I needed as a child has driven my passion for social emotional learning in our public schools. Today, I will be talking with Dr. Meg Eason Hines. Dr. Hines is a lecturer and the coordinator of gifted and creative education at the University of Georgia. Dr. Hines has worked in the Georgia College of Education program since 2005. Before her position at UGA, Meg was an instructor at the College of Charleston in Charleston, South Carolina. Meg also worked as an elementary public school teacher for eight years in Atlanta, Georgia, Augusta, Georgia, and Charleston, South Carolina. Meg is a recipient of the National Association for Gifted Children's 2003 Doctoral Student Award and the Georgia Association of Gifted Children's 2017 Mary Fraser Equity and Excellence Award. Currently, Meg serves as a member of NAGC's Special Populations Network and as a member of the Editorial Review Panel for Teaching for High Potential, which is one of NAGC's leading journals for practitioners. Our discussion today will focus on the immense need for SEL in our schools, particularly for our gifted children. We will get the chance to hear about her experiences as an educator and professor, her views for our future, and what we can do to help. So hi, Dr. Hines. It's so great to have you here. I'm excited to talk to you about social emotional learning, particularly with gifted students. So before we get started into the conversations, I want to ask you um, to give me a brief explanation of what you're currently doing in the field of gifted education, specifically for um, the student social emotional development. Okay. Well, um, I think the first thing that um, I would say that I'm doing around social and emotional learning um, is I teach a social and emotional course that all of our um, masters and educational specialists and doctoral students take. Um, it's probably my favorite course that I teach. Um, I really enjoy um, watching. I mean, I think the thing about my job in general is I love to watch people come in contact with new information that um, changes who they are and changes what they do with the children in their classrooms. Um, and so that's always kind of the, the joyful part of, of my job is to really watch people learn new things and have that um, applied in their classrooms and eventually affect um, the lives of children. So that really, um, and so this course does that in a really different way because a lot of what, um, we learn about in the rest of the program is a lot of, you know, um, and I don't want to downplay it like mechanical, but just like, what do I do? You know, I'm a teacher of bright children. What do I do? And so we, we look at that in, in a lot of different ways. And I think um, understanding this kind of whole other component um, to all kids, but specifically what does social and emotional learning look like for bright kids um, is really kind of a very new concept or idea to a lot of teachers um, in our program. Um, and they really, um, you know, once kind of in the course and, and beginning to get exposed to that material, it just resonates with them so much because it's just, you know, they, whether they realize it or not, a lot of what they do and a lot of what they need to do and learn more how to do is work with their students around social and emotional learning. Um, so, yeah, That's the first thing that I do, um, you know, my own dissertation work was in underachievement. And so um, I have a, um, you know, an interest in looking at, um, you know, why kids may not be as successful for a variety of reasons. And oftentimes that really um, intersects with 
concepts that we know about with bright children and social emotional learning around, you know, identity development and um, relationships that they might have with their peers or um, the ways that they learn or their learning preferences at school, um, whether they're getting uh, matched well with the things that they're talented or good at and how them grow, you know, so there's all kinds of social and emotional things around that. So that's really how, um, you know, a lot of my work as a graduate student was around that idea of underachievement. Um, and so most recently, I think I um, have been doing a lot of work, um, both within our department and at the state level with um, some anti-racism work. And so, um, you know, a lot of our students who come from, you know, culturally different backgrounds, um, you know, experience things in a unique way because they come from those backgrounds and because they're bright children. And, um, you know, that I think that yeah. Even though my work isn't specific to social emotional learning, there's an impact there of some of the things that I'm doing, the projects that I'm helping to facilitate and lead at our with our state organization. Um, so that's a little bit about what I'm doing with social emotional learning. Yeah, kind of like a smorgasbord of like a bunch of things, which is awesome. That is the theme of my life and my job. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of underachievement, I know that that is something that you heavily focus on. Can you tell me about maybe an underachieving student that changed your practice and how did their social emotional well-being affect that underachievement? Like, can sure. more well, I'll, I'll not necessarily tell you about a student. I'll tell you about myself. So yeah. I think that's why I came to wanting to study and learn about underachievement because um, I grew up as, you know, it was kind of like you, you learn to do what you know about yourself. And um, I grew up as an identified gifted student from the time I was very young. And, um, but as I grew, especially into kind of the middle school and high school years, um, I really could see myself differently than my peers. Um, and they were all achieving, I mean, I got A's and B's and I did fine, um, went to a good college and all that kind of stuff. But I really saw myself differently than a lot of my friends and my peers who were achieving really highly, um, you know, more than I was academically. And, 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 it, and school was um, challenging for me in that way. And I think um, there's a lot of things I could unpack about that. But this idea of underachievement, you know, me maybe not achieving at the same level that my peers were. Um, why was that? You know, that, that was a lot of untangling to do, um, you know, not feeling as good as feeling less than. Um, and also because um, part of my work um, in that, that area of research was around um, creatively gifted students. So I saw um, I was a very creative, I mean, I am a very creative person, but was also um, very much like that as like a high schooler. And um, often the things that I was good at or that I enjoyed were not school things. They were not academic subjects. Um, you know, I danced and I did design with yearbooks. I was the editor. I did, you know, um, music and art and all these kinds of things. So I had this creative capacity. And so I really was questioning, you know, why, um, you know, why are, you know, really even questioning underachievement, you know, is it, we are expecting children to achieve in certain areas and not others. And why is that um, when they might be achieving um, really well and in, in a great way in things that we just don't even know about that happen outside of school. So that was kind of my um, entree into underachievement. That's a really good point too that you make about like the creativity portion of it. Cause like we can put a grade on anything academics. And so we label that as underachievement, right? But then we're not necessarily as teachers of academics looking at that the other things that are going on. So I think that that's an important thing for teachers to think about is like, I mean, you have the kid that draws in your class all the time and maybe they're underachieving, but maybe that's the thing that's like, what what put them in that gifted program? You know what I mean? Right. So, so maybe that, that's their thing, yeah. Yeah, so I think thinking like, social and emotionally, like I think making sure that they know that their talent is 
is good. Like that, I think that's right. really important. And that was like, I mean, for me, that was a thing, you know, I did all, I mean, I, I mean, I was at the dance studio, you know, four or five days a week, all day on Saturdays, all days on Sundays for most of my middle and high school. And I would do all these performances, you know, in the community and just, you know, and it's like, nobody even really knew that about, I mean, I'm, I, you know, teachers may not have even known that about me. Um, yeah, I would, think and I think there, you know, there's something not, not right with that. Um, yeah. I also think there's this important um, thing that we don't do. And that is um, for students like myself who do have these capacities like, like create creativity or whatever um, that are less academic-y um, is providing opportunity for students to use some of those skills and those talents that they have in those other areas in the academic classroom, do, do, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I, totally I was always really like jazzed and excited when I had teachers who would like give me projects and give me like enrichment stuff to do and all the stuff where I could use those creativity skills. Um, but that didn't always happen a lot. So. Yeah, I feel like now that social emotional learning and the understanding of that process in many schools, because I mean, it's tr they're trying to implement it in lots of schools. Um, for a matter of fact, Gwinnett County, the school, uh, the county that I work in, is currently starting a whole countywide initiative to implement social emotional learning. Mm -hmm. So it makes me wonder: Are they looking through it with different lenses, or are they just doing like a broad social? Like, I'm curious what it is. So. I guess my next question would be like, what is the importance of SEL for our gifted children? Like, can you describe the main, I guess, topics that or um, issues that we see arise in gifted children? Um, well, I think it's more just for, for me, I think that, um, you know, it's important to recognize those things that do you know, social and emotional learning is important for all kids. Um, but when you're looking at different kind of populations of students, it's important to recognize what maybe some of those unique characteristics are to that group, whether that's young kids versus older kids, or it's bright kids versus, you know, other, all the other kids, you know, I think the more, you know, the more, you know, um, the more you're able to meet students where there are and build those relationships and, and, help them, support them, um, you know, academically, um, emotionally, and, and so forth. But, you know, I think that um, some of those things, some of those characteristics that um, are important for us to recognize in bright kids or gifted kids that are kind of in that social emotional, um, you know, it's just recognizing things like, um, you know, their maturity, um, uh, you know, as, as more mature than some of their peers, or, um, you know, they have oftentimes, one of my favorite things is, is their highly developed sense of humor. Um, you know, that's something else that I think is indicative of bright kids. Um, resilience, um, and that's not always the case, but sometimes um, these students can be very resilient. Um, uh, one of the big things I think that, um, and, and not all of these students, obviously some of these characteristics I'm talking about, they're not for all bright kids or all gifted kids, but these are some of the things we see um, is the idea of perfectionism. So really having those high expectations of themselves um, and also of others, you know, whether that's their friends or their family or their teachers or their school experience, they oftentimes have really high expectations and how that unfolds can affect them, right, in, in some different ways, whether that's um, and the long haul really um, exhausting them because they're trying to be perfect at everything or it's relational where they expect their friends to be, you know, be a certain way or, you know, whatever. And if they don't meet, meet that, then the, then they're disappointed when they're with their friends having those high, you know, too high expectations sometimes. Um, I think also motivation is another thing that we see. Um, so, you know, going back to that idea of underachievement, thinking about 
students who may be intrinsically motivated um, or extrinsically motivated. Um, oftentimes there's a lot around underachievement for, for um, you know, motivation is different in those students that it really um, is an external locus of control where things externally motivate those kinds of students. And that's part of the challenge with an underachieving bright student. Um, or you might, you know, oftentimes these kids have a really high internal motivation um, that they, they want to achieve, go further, deeper, do things more complex and all that kind of stuff. Um, I also think one of the other big things is um, kind of their emotional sensitivity. Um, and I think you can see that played out in a lot, you know, a lot of different ways with students. Um, I'll never forget um, my colleague Sally Purcell tells the story of her son who um, she was actually a teacher at the school at the time and they had gone to um, you know where uh, all the students gather for some kind of special um, you know uh, this in this case it was a performance and um, she as they were leaving she noticed that her son was crying and another teacher had kind of shuffled him into a room and, and she got to him and he was so moved by the music that he was crying. Um, and so I think I use that example to, you know, say like he was a middle school boy and he was crying um, as an emotional response to this beautiful music. Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine what the other kids <laughs> <laughs> might have done to him in that case, right? You know, so that that's an example of, I think, a bright child responding in a non-average way emotionally. And that, you know, what's beautiful about that, but what also can maybe even be problematic about that. Sure. Um, he might suffer with his peers making fun of him or, or whatever. Um, but just also intensity. And I didn't mention this in the beginning, but um, one of my other really important um, ways that I work with social emotional learning is, is raising my three children. <laughs> so they, um, I live in a house with very highly intense emotional people. Um, so that's been an interesting journey. Um, my children are um, 18, 15, and 13. Um, and so just in these different seasons of their lives from infancy and toddlerhood to young child to now, you know, adolescent and teenager and emerging adult, um, you know, really watching um, and working with them and living with in relationship with them um, with all of their intensities. Um, so that's a definitely a thing. Um, but also, you know, even though those kinds of things can be challenging and frustrating, I think um, also, um, just talking about my children, like just how empathic they are, um, you know, and that empathy that's so um, out of sync with age mates that they really have um, compassion and um, the ability to see things from another perspective and um, to care about and help and, you know, want to do for others. Um, they have that capacity more than I think maybe their age mates at different, you know, at different points, depending on what the situation was. But anyway, does that kind of answer your question? Absolutely. Definitely. Lots of um, things that we can think about too. And I like that you shared information about your kids because you really see it all the time. I'm sure you see it in different ways too, or like where mm -hmm. they need that social emotional learning, but maybe even just that support from their mom. Like it, that makes, it's interesting to see that, like we talk so much about teachers, but how can we also support like families and supporting their kids at home? So there's lots of things to think about. Um, so I've noticed that like many teachers that are implementing social emotional learning in the classroom, they find it daunting. Like it's a task that's going to take too much time and there's really none available. What kind of advice or what would you say to these teachers who are pushing against it because they're like, we just don't have time for it. Right. And I think that's a natural response by teachers to, um, I mean, I think it's a sign of the times because there's just so many things that are being put upon teachers to have to do. I mean, not even talking about, you know, the pandemic and all the, the, things that are going to go along with that. Um, but I think that um, 
you know, it reminds me a lot of, I, I do a lot of work with teachers teaching them about um, using creativity in the classroom as well. And it reminds me very similarly of that is that I try to encourage teachers not to think about it as in addition to, um, but how can you build your toolbox so that you can infuse these things that it's not costing you extra time. I mean, it will to like adjust and modify and, you know, in, integrate things into your um, time honored lessons and units and things like that. But once you kind of learn um, some strategies that you can use, it can be very seamlessly worked into, um, you know, the things that you already do. And so I always um, think that helping teachers learn about some of those strategies like, um, you know, bibliotherapy. So using books, biographies, films, and all kinds of other media um, that can be uh, focused on some, you know, some of those topics I was just talking about earlier and weaving that into things like language arts um, or even history, um, I think is a really valuable tool. Um, I think that using, um, you know, things like creativity in the arts is an is a, um, opportunity to um, really dive into some of those um, kind of socially and emotional things, whether you're asking students to um, create, you know, creative writing, um, poetry, um, even create works of art, um, you know, interpretive with, you know, role playing and characters and theater kinds of thing. I think there's a lot of opportunity there for students to tap into understanding emotions, even complex emotions through um, things that they develop on their own, whether that's um, self-reflective or um, as a result of an experience that they've had, or whether they're looking at, you know, historical figures or characters in literature, um, where they can really kind of analyze that and then compare that to themselves and, and how maybe they've experienced similar things and some of those things um, that characters experience that would be in alignment with, you know, some of these characteristics that I talked about earlier. Yeah, absolutely. I do agree, especially with like the bibliotherapy and cinema therapy. I think finding, especially like within history, there are so many um, famous like people that we could talk about who were gifted, who right. went through um, some of the same emotions and feelings and for them to be able to relate. And I, I feel like that totally helps with identity development. So I like that you mentioned that. So to kind of end this, I want to know, like, are there any resources that you would suggest teachers use or maybe even like websites for teachers to read and find more information? Yeah, I think a couple things come to mind. I mean, I know this is a textbook, um, but I think it also gives this is the text that I use in my course. Um, it's an investment, but if you can find a way to check it out, um, it really just is a great, um, you know, kind of. Bible, if you will, for social emotional learning with with um, gifted students, and it and it really goes into not just the strategies, the practical things that I think teachers can use, which is what they probably want the most, but there's also good background in here um, examining a lot of those characteristics that I mentioned, as well as um, just kind of theoretical background. And some other things like identity development and contextual influences, because, you know, the feelings and things that students experience don't happen in a vacuum. There's it's all there's always a context there, whether we're talking about, you know, what happens within the family or the context of the school or the classroom or the friendships or the community. You know, so I think there's a lot of great things to explore in, in that book. Um, another uh, resource that I would point people to, and I haven't really looked at it a lot lately, but um, Free Spirit Press, I think it's Free Spirit, uh, or maybe it's publishing, Free Spirit Publishing, um, really is a great resource for all kind of social and emotional learning. They do have some specific resources for gifted students for, or for bright students, um, but there's also the stuff there for, you know, if you're a classroom teacher, you're probably looking at social and emotional learning for all different kinds of children in your classroom, and so it's a great um, they have books, they have, um, um, you know, I think they even have like posters and pamphlets and, um, uh, for lack of a better term, games, you know, like discussion starters and like materials that you could use, 
um, to really get kids talking or get um, get things out there in the open to do different things with. So I would I'd recommend both of those as resources. Awesome. I actually have never heard of um, that website. You said Free Spirit. Free Spirit. Pretty sure that's right. Publishing, whichever one. Yeah. So I'll have to take a look at that one for sure. Um, thank you for sharing those. So sure. also, thanks so much for joining me today. And I'm so excited to share this with um, my colleagues and your efforts in fostering social emotional need needs and gifted children is evident. It's really inspiring. And also, I think um, being part of your class was awesome. It's pushed me to want to do this um, more research, more work in the field and being able to share that with others. So thank you so much for joining me today. It was such a pleasure, Faith. I appreciate you inviting me. It was fun. For those of you listening, please feel free to share this podcast with your fellow teachers, administrators, and friends. Let's move together one step closer to fully supporting our students socially and emotionally.